Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much for having us today um, and for attending the session, of course. Um, my name is Ellen Nichols and I'm joined by my colleague Anita Love. Um, together, we work as educational developers at Nottingham Trent University, leading on the active collaborative learning staff development work stream. And more interestingly, we are joined by three of our wonderful second year students from the Department of Psychology. So we have with us Kabita, Hannah and Katie, who have been working with us as partners on a co-creation project entitled Gamifying Flip Learning, Student Motivation in the Context of Active Learning and Independent Pre-Work. So in today's session, we will be taking a co-storytelling approach um, to walk you through our experiences so far of undertaking this project. And you're actually catching us in the kind of midpoint of this, of this process. And to that end, we want to invite you to become active participants or co-creators in the project as well, adding your insights, your experiences to enrich the project, its recommendations and its outputs. So please do use the chat throughout this session. Um, we'll have opportunities where we'll, we'll ask you to do that more intentionally, but we will we'll welcome your thoughts and inputs as we go through it as well. So the story actually starts just over 10 years ago when NTU made the decision to adopt the active collaborative learning pedagogy scale up as its signature approach to teaching and learning. And scale up is you may well know it already. Uh, it is an acronym that stands for student centred active learning environment with upside down pedagogies. Um, and this, of course, is an active mode of learning and it offers an alternative to traditional lectures, as many active collaborative learning pedagogies do. So in scale up, students encounter course content for the first time outside of class via independent pre-work before using this information in class through collaborative application activities in strategically formed groups. So rather than predominantly listening to their lecturers, students learn through solving problems, sharing ideas, giving and receiving feedback and teaching each other. And the environment that they work within is designed to promote maximum uh, participation, collaboration and activity. And you can just see this sort of in the background picture here, which is an image from an NTU scale up lesson. So Anita, do you want to? Yeah, want... that's fine. Yes. Yeah. So there are six core components that must be in operation for the scale up pedagogy to be occurring. And you can see those on the screen now. And the, the component we want to focus on today and which is central to our story is flipped learning. So as educational developers, we work with staff day in, day out to support them to develop effective learning and teaching strategies for the benefit of their students. But one barrier we keep on coming across time and time again when we look to promote the adoption of active collaborative learning and scale up in particular is the fact that students are not completing their flip learning or pre-work, meaning that staff are feeling obliged to cover this material again in class. Um, and this is therefore eaten into the time that's designed to be spent on application activities and it creates this cycle of students not completing as they know it will be covered in that class anyway. So what, occur, what appears to be occurring is that students are experiencing a lack of motivation for engaging in the pre-work and staff are subsequently experiencing a lack of resilience when they discover that their students are not engaging in materials they've spent loads of time preparing. And I've been one of those people that's done that. And this particular cocktail of emotions and barriers can often lead to either the dilution of active learning pedagogies or just at the absolute outright abandonment of active teaching and learning approaches. So we were left to consider what strategies colleagues might adopt to enhance the student motivation to engage in flipped learning. And this is where... Our students and came in and the <laughs> of our co-creation project. Um, as as many of you will know, and if you've been attending the sessions throughout the week, there is an extensive body of evidence from educational researchers, some of which our students, by the way, are about to, to talk you through, um, that shows how elements of fun and competition can promote student engagement in pre-work. And we wanted to tap into that. Um, we wanted to, 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 to trial it as a potential strategy that our lecturers might adopt. So why, why co-creation then? Because, of course, co-creation 
is actually central to this whole solution for us. It's, it's of course, a process by which students actively collaborate with educators to solve problems. And this way, students are involved in designing and shaping their own learning, um, their own experience as a student. And it creates that kind of beautiful or it tries to create that beautiful flattened hierarchy in order to to work as partners to do so and and to that end co-creation was the perfect way to approach this project for us because co-creation is itself a form of active collaborative learning for all participants we learn from the students students learn from us together we can create something that we think is much much stronger um, so what we wanted from partnering with our students was the to benefit really from the value of their lived experiences, both as individuals and as NTE students. We wanted we, we asked them and they've done a wonderful job of this um, to create for us an insightful literature review to contextualize some of this to begin to to flesh out some some solutions as to how to implement it. And we also asked them to begin the process of developing online game based content using H5P, which you may have heard of, um, which we'd like uh, our staff to use so they, they could use a kind of adaptable template um, for generating their own flipped learning. And that's kind of a, the bit of the process that we're on at the moment. And the students have made a fantastic start on this. Our research questions were, why are university students not motivated to engage in flipped learning? And how can gamification techniques create a motivational framework that encourages students to engage with online flipped learning. So I'm going to shut up because it's, I think, the people who can tell you the next part of the story are our students. So I'm going to hand over now to Kabata, who's going to talk talk you through um, or begin to talk you through uh, what their most interesting findings were from undertaking the literature review. So Kabata, over to you. Yeah, so um, I'm going to just start off with the benefits um, to flip learning. Um, so obviously it offers numerous benefits, um, with personalised learning being one of its key advantages. Um, by allowing students to engage with instructional materials at their own pace and in their preferred learning styles, personalised learning fosters a deeper understanding of concepts. This tailored approach enables educators to kind of address individual strengths and weaknesses more effectively, which leads to increased academic achievement and student satisfaction. Um, next, we have enhanced critical thinking. Um, and these are a significant benefit of flip learning. Um, by shifting the traditional lecture format outside the classroom, students have more time for active learning activities during class time. Um, and this gives opportunities for deeper discussions, problem solving exercises and kind of hands on activities that challenge students to think critically and apply their knowledge in real world scenarios. Um, and as a result of this, students become more adept at analysing information, evaluating arguments and making some more informed decisions, um, which I think is a crucial skill set for success in both academics and work. Um, finally, flip learning promotes collaborative thinking by encouraging peer interaction and group work um, and by engaging in this in these collaborative activities during class sessions, students are able to learn how to communicate effectively, sharing ideas and collaborating with their peers to, to kind of solve problems and then achieve common goals. Um, and then this collaborative approach not only enhances students' understanding of the material, but also promotes teamwork and interpersonal skills, which prepare them for the collaborative nature of the workplace. Um, and I will pass on to Hannah for the barriers. Um, hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to focus on the barriers to flip learning. Um, one of the biggest reasons that um during that I found during the research was that um students have a lot of responsibilities outside of university, such as adapting to life on their own as a university student, having a social life. Also, many students um do part time work as well, and because of that, they don't have time to go through all the to do the flip learning of like every single module. So they have to do a cost benefit analysis sort of where they decide which which modules are you're, they're going to benefit more from if they do the flip learning or not or if if the if the lecturer is going to go through it in class they might decide that they won't that there's no point in them doing it at home because it's going to be covered anyway um a second reason that i found is that the that larger class sizes mean less engagement with the lecturer so if the lecturer has around like 200 students in our class they're not able to have that um personal 
that personal experience that Kamata was talking about. And so they're less likely to engage, they're more likely to be passive in class. And because of that, they won't be motivated to do to do the work outside of class because they're not really enjoying the module itself. And I think I need to highlight this earlier, but there is a cycle of where if students don't do the pre-work, then they don't, then the lecturer goes over it in class and then the students feel like they don't have to do the work as well. And it kind of creates a cycle where, okay, if no one's gonna do it outside, we might as well do it in, in class. And and yeah, so then the, the students are motivated, the teachers aren't motivated to assign the work and it creates this kind of stalemate. Um, all these factors basically culminate in students not engaging in the flipped learning and teachers being discouraged to set it. Um, so yeah, now I'll hand over to KD to talk about um, gamification. Right. Okay, so moving on to gamification. So talking, so it kind of links to the barriers. So um with to overcome the barriers we can use gamification so gamification is where game like uh, elements are applied to learning activities and as you can see there's some images so like this is such as like feedbacks uh, point scoring earning badges leaderboards things like that which create you know that game like experience within an activity outside of games such as like learning um so moving on uh so why is gamification so important in the context of flipped learning? So gamification enhances students' achievements and attitudes to class. And uh, research by Yildrim, 2017, um, found that students that engaged in gamification flipped learning compared to just regular flipped learning, which is just reading the content and not really doing any like active work with it, uh, they found that 14 weeks later when they were studied again, um, these the students that were in the gamification condition actually performed better, um, showing that it you know enhanced their achievements and their grades and their attitudes and just their overall experience of learning. Um, and then next we've got um, how gamification creates a sense of competence within students. So specifically things such as like badges and leaderboards, this creates a sense of like, oh, I'm doing the work myself, like I'm, I'm doing this for myself, which encourages students to work more and put in more effort. Um, and they're more likely to continue with the gamification because they see it as like they're taking it into their own hands, um, which is a good thing, especially in uni when you can be given that, at higher education anyways, when you can be given that like responsibility and it's just nice to be in control of your education. Uh, so now we've got a Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, please put them into the chat box or the chat section um, about any of the things that we've mentioned. Um, so yeah, thank you. So I've got a few questions that I think um, people might want to hear anyway. So yeah. I'm going to, uh, we've, we've got some pre-prepared ones. So the first one I was going to ask Kabata. So um, can you share Kabata what your experience of flip learning was like before you, you started this project? Yeah, so I think as for many students, especially in first year, I you kind of start off and you really want to do well. And so you're doing all of the pre-work that you're given. But I think once you start to get into lectures and realise that the majority of the cohort haven't done those that pre-work and you're kind of and you know as as you and Hannah touched on earlier it kind of you're trying to as a student minimize the amount of work that you're doing that isn't necessary um and I think you kind of find that if other people aren't doing the work the lecturer recovers it and it's like well what was really the point of me doing that work when I could have used that time to do other work that I actually do need to do um so I think before, and we're, we're not really taught about flip learning, we, you don't understand the benefits mm. of it. Um, and so I think we kind of, you kind of just accept that you're not going to do it because mm. you're going to get it taught it again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of, yeah, it's, as you said, it's very... It needs it needs the academics to hold firm in their stance, doesn't exactly, it, with, yeah. with, with it, and not, and not buckle under that, you know, that they haven't done oh then the, the thought that everyone hasn't done it don't buckle don't buckle just carry on and do that that application activity so what I was going to ask Katie now was now having completed the project 
if you could share with us academics without naming their names who use flip learning really well in their teaching and why you think how they do this is good um so I think my the main module which does this um the best is so with our course we mainly have um lectures which are quite passive so they kind of just talk at us so I think the best module which I do it in is like cognitive and bio and that's a lecture so there's like a hundred of us at a time in a class yeah. Um, and at the start they do like these questions and it's really fun because everyone can get involved and they add like a fun spin onto the questions as well and it's almost like people know it's coming because it's so consistent and it's happened at the start of every lecture it's really good because you know it's coming and it's not like oh we've tried it one week and then we're not going to do it the next week because of the consistency people are actually looking forward to going to it so it's really good and like especially the questions they ask it's like it's just really helpful. And I think that when you make it fun, you know, even for 20, 21, 22 or older, it's still fun to like engage with other people and have that kind of like gamified part to yeah, yeah. your learning, which is always so fun. So it's made you do the reading because you know you're going to get yeah. asked those questions as the sort of opening activity each yeah. time you go into that class with that particular lecturer. Thank you for that, KD. And then I was going to ask um, a quick question around being part of a co-creation team, Hannah. How have you found this experience being part? Um, I think it was a really, it was a really different experience to what I thought it was going to be to begin with. I think the team that I've worked around with, KD and Kabata and you, Ellen and Mel as well, I think everything was just so it wasn't as much pressure as I thought it was going to be and I think as a smaller group me Capita and Katie we worked really well like as a group we were able to identify each other's strengths and like I guess when we got into a flow of like creating doing the literature review creating the gamified content on H5P I think we were able to bounce off each other really well thank you yeah Thanks, Hannah. And then finally, how do you feel gamification of flip learning can support academics? Katie, you've probably already touched on this a little bit. Yeah, I think we kind of did, but um, (laughs) I just think like gamification is something which isn't just down to one, like just the students. Like it's something where we have to work together. Mm -hmm. And I think especially with academics, it can help create a relationship with students, especially, especially if you see maybe some students aren't, achieving as well it can be really good because you could even see with like their points and things like that that they might need more support and that's something that you wouldn't be able to get if you didn't have gamification you wouldn't know if they've engaged in the flip learning any other way so it's just a good way to create that relationship back with your students especially when you're if you're on a course as big as ours yeah yeah can't have those more like smaller classes um yeah it's just it's just a good thing yeah and it's also good to be like aware and work putting the effort as well as your students putting in the effort as well. Yeah, so just to give you the context, you're on a course, aren't you, with cohorts of, is it three to 400 each year group? Yeah. yeah. Psychology, it's one of the biggest courses at, at NTU. So huge cohorts that are being taught um, sometimes all together in a lecture theatre as well. So a re- some really, really good points there, Katie. Ellen, I don't know if you've managed to have a scan of the questions, if I there's have. any others. Yeah, that we are have good. lots of questions, actually. OK, and, yeah. Um, I'm just, we might have to be a little bit selective with, our, with which ones we choose to answer just because of the time. Yeah. Um, So Claire asked, what was one of your favourite gamification activities? Um, Just a bit of context. Do you want to just say what platform you use and talk about H5P and then move into that question around what your favourite gamification activities were? Don't know if KD might want to answer this one because I know you (laughs) you had the gamification slide. (laughs) So we use this um, platform called H5P um and within that there's loads of different like gamification tools and we basically used it was like a map it was like a hotspots was it called yeah there were so it was the main one is kind of like a branching scenario so it takes you off into different branches on the topic and then within that there's different there's other different activities you can do so there's um like true or false there was hotspots which was also really fun which is basically you select an image and then it shows you information and then it can ask you questions we also did um, like voiceovers and like things like that so that students can hear you talking and then you can score points from answering questions later on, fill in the blanks, things like that. Um, 
so we have quite a range and we also looked at other different tools which we couldn't integrate but we'll go on to that later with our recommendations but we also looked at another thing called the chase which is kind of like Kahoot, which I'm sure most of you have probably heard of but it's very similar to that where you can do it in the class um, which was also really fun because it kind of creates that competition and that leaderboard again um, but that was the platform that we used so I don't know if Cabby wanted to say which one we liked the most or Hannah um, I think for me my favourite was probably the hot spots just because I feel like it was like a good mix of kind of interaction but also you kind of had to like read the information get into your head then you were doing questions mm. and it, it was very like consolidating and I think that was I think that's probably my favorite one fantastic thank you um I've got a question that might be it's, it, it doesn't have a, an easy answer I might actually pose it to Anita um how much prep do you think is needed for your ideal gamification and maybe the, the students might want to chip in with this because you you were doing it but um Anita as someone who's been a senior lecturer and put a lot of effort into designing yeah work do you have some reflections on that of how long it would take to to set one up and also having just started to do one a long a long time a long time to do it so that it's valuable and it and it's going to be used um I mean the students made it look so easy when they did theirs yeah. um you yeah, guys you get, <laughs> yeah you guys did it really quick um which was brilliant but 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 actually having said that you'd spent a lot of time with the literature re review so you'd spent a lot of time gathering your information your research um I think it does take time to do it well um but I think obviously you've then got it and then you can adapt it can't you as the years go on if if you want to make changes to it once you've got a good grounding for it trial it see how that works with the students and then add to it take bits away change bits up once you've got it in that h5p it's easier to do that isn't it once you've got all the little sections you can just change them um so h5p is something that we used um through our system which is called now which is bright space i'm sure a lot of you have similar uh, at your um places of work as well um is it worth us going on to share in the slides again just so that we can show the recommendations yeah. there Lynn? yeah um and we'll see if we've got any time to answer a few more as well. yeah, yeah. just share my uh, screen again yeah. While you're doing that, would you consider popping the slides onto the festival Padlet? I've put the link yes. to the Padlet in the chat so people can look at it later. Yes, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I don't know who's doing this slide. Was it one of, I think uh, one, of the stu one of the students was going to walk us through? Do you want I to think we're all doing it. Yeah, yeah, they're all doing we're it. We're all getting involved. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, we just made a basically a list of recommendations that we couldn't put within our H5P content like template. Uh, we just didn't have really have time for it. But um, we so we've created this list. I'm just going to explain kind of what's um, what's going on in it. Um, so the first recommendation we have is a leaderboard type activity. Um, so I'm sure some of you have heard of Kahoot or something like the Chase. Um, that kind of game content, which can all be found on H5P. Um, so this should be done kind of at the start of class to consolidate any pre-work you're doing. Um, and it, it does encourage competition and motivate students to engage in pre-work. I think the competition sounds like when you're a child, you want competition, but I know me and all the people that I know are very like into competition and it does make you want to do the work. Um, and then the next thing we have is creating like a points based system. So kind of similar to the first one, uh, students can gain points as they work through the content and kind of get activity questions correct. Um, and this can also be linked to a leaderboard, which, again, creates a sense of competition and makes students want to complete work. Um, yeah, next we have the we um, we suggested that you should use face to face videos for when you do video content instead of just maybe doing a voiceover because it creates a relationship between the student and the teacher. It encourages them to instead of watching a video like a YouTube like a YouTube video, have like actually seeing your lecturer's face create builds a relationship and builds a rapport that that would encourage students to engage in the pre work later. Um, we also have the image hotspot 
hotspots, which I mentioned before. So you can use text and audio recordings. When you click on an image, it will pop up. And again, it creates a relationship between the student and the teacher. So it's not pass it's not like you're learning passively and you're just reading content, which can be a bit monotonous and a bit boring. When you get when you um have audio recordings, it just allows you to engage a bit more and you actually have to listen to what's being said, otherwise you're gonna miss it and not answer the questions correctly. And then um, we also added a virtual 360 tour onto the re recommendations because we understand not all some um, courses are more creative, such as like art and like things like that. So we thought of adding that where you could, it's like kind of like Google Maps where you can kind of follow it around and you can explore different areas of like his like historical landmarks, things like that. So we thought that was interesting. And then you can also integrate like the hotspots and all of the other questions where you can score points. You can put that all into the virtual 360 tour. And then the final recommendation we had was adding a show solution option. So with our practice one that we made or our template, we didn't add that because it was just like very simple questions. But if it's something more difficult, it might just be good to kind of have a guide for students to if they don't know the answer and they don't want to go back and read all the information, which might be a bit difficult. But they can just you can show the solution. It just makes it a lot easier for them, especially when it's already quite tiring. You don't want to put too much extra time. But um yeah we added that one as well just for just like as a basic recommendation so thank you um we as i as i mentioned before we're in the mid midpoint of the project uh we've begun the work on gamification we want to take ideally we want to take what hannah cavater and katie have started and try out the chase activity um to yeah. see how how we might embed that create that link between the flipped work and then the in-person session um because the chase you need to use uh in the classroom with the students rather than bef before in the pre-work um but we want to know from you which of these uh activities which of these recommendations you you might try using or and why or if not why you wouldn't and why not um so in, in the time we in the, in the few minutes we have left we want to hear more from you so please do feel free to use the chat to do that. So while people are putting things into the chat, I can talk about the um, virtual 360 tour. Um, so that's one that I would would have used um, in my old role as um, senior lecturer on fashion um, management. Um, because it would have been a really good way of showing students um, around factories and textile plants um, offshore. And you could have little tours around it and then zoom in on particular areas like, a, you know, a loom or something and then get more details about the type of loom or uh, the makeup process, etc. And it was actually something that when I was in my old department, we were starting to spec out in terms of doing that, trying to work out how we could get the filming done. So I I can see that once you've got that, although there's a big outlay for that in the first place and working with people in order to do it, you've got that toolkit and it's a brilliant as a, as a resource for the future. Um, and for something like the fashion industry that where the makeup process isn't going to change by an awful lot, it's something that's, you know, not going to go out of date that particularly that quickly. Um, so in the chat, I'm interested in the, in the 5HP tool, how easy it and have you have you ever used it before? Viv, I've used it very recently, so is Ellen. Mm -hmm. It was very easy to use, but we didn't pick it up as quickly as the students did. They picked it up very quickly. It took me last week, I was starting to use it and um, I think it. I think within an hour, I'd, I'd sort of worked it out. But it did. It it took some time. But it, it's it, it it's very self-explanatory. And Ellen's um, popped a link in there, and in the link, it takes you through each of the processes. And I would say it's really good in terms of it has little hoverovers to tell you what to do next. So, um, oh, I know. Students <laughs> want to comment on how easy they are. Uh, how how did you find using the H five P tool? Um, I found the H5P, I think it's just kind of like trial and error. Like, I feel like I got, we got hold of it very, very quickly. I think the more difficult thing was understanding how to put things in. So for example, when you do the um, branching scenario, you have to do like slideshows and things like that. So we pre-made our slideshows wanting to put them in. And then we faced a problem where actually we couldn't put 
insert them from PowerPoint. We have to do it all over again. And their like format is, isn't as nice as PowerPoint, but we figured a way around it. We literally just screenshot our PowerPoints and added extra text. But um, it was, it's quite easy, I think. I think, it. I mean, it took us like a day and a half, two days to do. So it's it's quite easy once you know what you want to put into it and once you know what you're actually doing with it it's very easy to get your hands around thank you um I'm just reading some messages so there's one I've I've seen a really good one that would be interesting to post to the students leaderboards are interesting does everybody like their scores being shown have have you ever been in a a tour environment Katie Hannah and Cabota where you've where you've where an academic has done anything with a leaderboard and they've shown you your score and have you liked that or not how have how have you felt I think what our lecturers tend when they do do things like this they tend to kind of not show the whole leaderboard but do like first second third place and I think that's better because obviously if you haven't done very well in your last yeah you don't really want to be no but I think it's good because then it kind of motivates you to want to be on that leaderboard because then you're like oh I've got and like you're in a massive lecture hall nobody really knows who you are but it still gives you a sense of like oh I've done well and like you can see on your own phone or laptop whatever you're doing it on whether like where you place and it kind of does make you feel good about yourself and so I think it I think the leaderboard idea is a really good idea I've seen that it's two o'clock um I think we've probably come to the end we have got our references on the very end slide um I think so the references of that well not our references actually these are the references from all the reading the students did um so Ellen just leaves us to say goodbye and thank you very much thank you yeah we'll we'll keep um we'll keep the chat uh and try to to, res- to make some responses to some of these fantastic comments and questions it's great to see that you found the session valuable I hope you'll continue to find it so um and thank you for some of your ideas and engagements there's certainly some food for thought for us to take away um there are so many questions here that we've not been able to answer which I on the one hand love but also find frustrating so um we'll, we'll do our best to get back to you and just a big thank you from yes. us for yes. pretending and for your engagement